All right. There's no place like home, and whether it's furniture, artwork, home accessories, appliances, or that one-of-a-kind collectible, Yellow Brick Road Online Auctions allows you to find everything you need from the comfort of your own home. The owner of Yellow Brick Road Auctions has been conducting online estate auctions for over eight years by providing homeowners with a stress-free process to liquidate all items that have accumulated over the years. I'm Melissa Mendici, owner of Yellow Brick Road Auctions. Log on today to find your heart's desire. Hey, it's Seth from Mario's Barbershop in Parma, 7526 Broadview Road in the Pleasant Valley Shopping Center right next to Big Lots. You got to check out Mario, man. Great guy, does a lot for charities, but can perform miracles with hair. He even made me look clean cut. Does my hair, does a great job. Love talking to the guy while I'm sitting there. It's a great place to go local business. You got to go to Mario's Barbershop in Parma. Mario's Barbershop in Parma, 7526 Broadview Road. Again, in Parma, Pleasant Valley Shopping Center, right next to Big Lots. Or give them a call, 216-520-1977. That's 216-520-1977, Mario's Barbershop in Parma. Trust Joe's Lakewood Computer at 14035 Madison in Lakewood. They have over 30 years of professional service handling laptop and desktop repair services, virus removal, and data migration, and much more. You can trust them with hardware updates to your computer's memory and hard drive. Call 216-651-3880. Whether you need a simple Windows install or you're interested in the latest computers for gaming, call Joe's Lakewood Computer at 216-651-3880. This is Tim Elkhorn, radio voice of the Cleveland Cavaliers for attorney Will Spiegelberg. Will Spiegelberg is not only a name you know, he's someone you can trust as your attorney no matter the circumstance. Will Spiegelberg is an attorney you can always count on. Will Spiegelberg is the attorney you should contact for all your legal work. When you need an attorney, call Will Spiegelberg at 216-233-4240. Attorney. would be nice to be heard and seen I could say to myself and just play that it's all a dream from the knock on the door came a crack in the sky when it Awesome stuff. And joining us now, Joel Hoekstra. How you doing, my friend? Great. How are you guys? Good, good. We are fantastic. Good to have you on. Thanks for coming on tonight. Appreciate it. Yeah, likewise. Thanks for having me on. Sure. Well, Joel, you're a busy guy, man. When you're not in any of your 15 bands, you've um <laughs> you're you're now building Joel Hoekstra's 13. You have what? This is the third record with Crash of Life out on June the 13th great stuff um let's start there man tell us a little bit about this one comes pretty fast off the last one as well as right at the same time as revolution saints so kind of talk about where you're at you know musically and creatively um yeah i mean it's this is something that i started i guess back in 2015 i think as i was you know, getting more well known for being in the hard rock bands, et cetera. You know, my time with Night Ranger, Rock of Ages, Trans Siberian Orchestra, which is, you know, of course, still with White Snake, still with. But, um, you know, I, my solo albums were kind of done back when I was doing instrumental stuff, a little more like two kind of almost, uh, I guess, jazz like rock fusion, you know, sure. and, and, and an acoustic record, all instrumental. So, I had a lot of people saying, how come you don't have any solo music out that's like, a, you know, rock stuff? And so I thought, well, I'd like to do that, but I don't really want to do the style where like, you know, the guitar player is taking like, you know, two minute solos in every song or sure. doing like the instrumental thing anymore um, or progressive even where it really didn't sound all that appealing to me. So 
Um, I just kind of came up with this concept of trying to create like songs where I do all the writing. So I write all the riffs and then I write the lyrics and the vocal melodies, but try to come from a place of like just, you know, songs and what got me into this whole scene in the first place when I was a kid, you know, what made me like that era of rock and roll. So, and obviously this stuff is kind of, no matter what, spun like 2023. It's not exactly, it doesn't exactly sound like an 80s record if you listen to it, but right. I'm certainly inspired by that, that era of music. No doubt. Well, let, let's talk about this record and something that you just said, which I think is fascinating coming from you, which is that you write everything for Joel Holkstra's 13. Is that, is it a difficult adjustment or how do you adjust between that with this band and other projects and bands that you've been in? You know, obviously White Snake. that's a David Coverdale. You know, I know you write with him, but everything goes through him as far as the creative process and then revolution saints, which I, again, you collaborate, I, I believe on, but it's not only you. Is there, is there like a switch that has to turn on or off when you switch between projects? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think it's cool. I'm not opposed to doing the collaborative thing. I think it's great. Um, I think it's intriguing to, figure out, you know, what kind of results you get from different approaches. Um, so everyone has a different level that I, I, you know, move with. Like you said, you know, Coverdale, you know, for the most part, he's going to have an idea of a song mm -hmm. and maybe say, where would you take it from there? And you can contribute like guitar riffs, ideas where to go. You can't contribute like vocals or anything like that because he'll that's his territory, right? Mm -hmm. Rightfully so. No, no issues with that. That's, you know, that's David Coverdale. Um, and it was kind of the same, you know, with Night Ranger. Like, you know, it was sure. like be able to like put some guitar riffs in and things like that or come up with some kind of bed for them to like write lyrics or sing on. Um, but it wasn't going to be my gig to be like writing the lyrics and the melodies, etc. Um, so similar with Iconic, um, my project with Michael Sweet and Tommy Aldridge and Marco Mendoza and Nathan James. So that, um, you know, I, what I do for that is I do the guitar riffs unarranged. Michael Sweet arranges them. They go to right. Alessandro and then Nathan and they write the lyrics and the vocal melodies. So, you know, all these things I'm cool with. But like every once in a while, you want to be the guy that just is like, hey, man, I'm going to do all of it right <laughs> and and i get the the final say so in the mix and you know the production elements and i'm the guy to like okay the artwork etc and you have some input on all that so it's a lot more work i'll tell you that like you know when you, when you do this i literally like sing the entire record as a guide vocal for the lead vocalist to listen right. to and go from um very long answer to your question, but no, I mean, I, right. bottom line is I'm cool with all of it. Like, you know, if, if, if it's a, it's whatever framework it's in, like, let's see what we get. And that's cool. Cause you know, I don't know if necessarily I want every project to be like something that I'm doing all of. Um, sure. It can be cool to be just like a piece of the puzzle too. Um, but these, you know, the Joel Hooks just 13 things that, you know, the albums are, uh, they're very much my babies. All right. So first I got to, tell you that my sister-in-law is watching listening whatever and she's a super huge fan so he keeps sending me texts and stuff on my phone of just hearts and i'm like all right <laughs> i'm doing the show you gotta stop <laughs> sending texts of just hearts so she apparently is a big fan um what was it about the 80s music that made it so different from um the, the sounds that have come since then and rock music to me isn't the same as it was back then and i like the fact that they're bands out there still trying to keep that sound alive what made that kind of sound so special different um you know i'm not necessarily like um 100 80s guy i kind of yeah. like i am a i would say more of a classic rock guy because i've fallen so far out of touch with like you know when people ask me about new bands i'm like dude i have no idea like, it sucks <laughs> I, I work on music all the time so i fall behind because my career got so busy that it's like well i worked on music like six seven hours today do i want to like sit back and listen to new bands no. right <laughs> want to like get away from music basically so um I mean, ACDC is what got me in. That's what pulled me in, back in black, you know, hearing that and seeing Angus Young and being like, that's the coolest dude I've ever seen. Um, and, you know, that was great hard rock. And I really loved, 
I would say the, you know, 70s stuff where the bands were kind of prolific together. The 80s, I loved how all the guitar players were prolific, you know, like sure. we had this whole this whole movement where all the guitar players really um, were technically, you know, amazing, really. I mean, it was like expected that you were going to be a, a great lead player in the 80s. So that was fun, you know, having that. Um, become the norm and I even like some of the 90s stuff you know like I, I definitely like Alice in Chains and I like Soundgarden and, and I like Stone Temple Pilots I think there's a lot of good songs there some of it wasn't for me um, and I didn't really understand the whole I don't want to be a rock star but I'm going to keep putting out albums mentality it was like <laughs> right. well you could not be a rock star in a hurry you could just stop recording or <laughs> putting out your music publicly that um, so that didn't necessarily make sense to me but um, you know, when it, when it comes to the eighties, that just happened to be that magic era where I was starting guitar, you know, and there was a lot of inspiration, of uh, guitar wise in that, that generation. And, and I think what appealed to me too, as a kid was be because like, you know, the guitar being good on guitar was cool in the eighties. It was cool to like accept other styles like you you know you could put on al di miola back then and have people not be like what are you listening to this for you know right 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 um whereas i don't know if this generation they think the same you know like i loved the guitar heroes like steve morse who was putting out you know you could listen to one of his records and there would be a country track on there you know right. and just you know all these different styles represented um or you listen to you know these guys who were taking it out there you know steve Vai kind of became the Hendrix of the eighties, you know, mm -hmm. kind of taking all the, all the wild sounds and all the, you know, psychedelia and putting it with all the technical capabilities that he was doing. And um, so, you know, that, that stuff was cool to me too, but really the, the core of it for me was like all bands, you know, like I just love the, the, the bands, right. um, love the tunes. And, and so that's what this comes down to for me. It's like, all right, I don't really want to use this as like a guitar showcase. I want to use it as like, what would I have liked to listen to when I was younger? Yeah, because I, Chris and I argue about this kind of stuff all the time. Because I turned on the radio the other day, and there's like three freaking rock stations, and none of them are playing any good new rock. <laughs> I don't know if there's any good new rock out there. And Chris Sprague's telling me there is. Yeah, but it's tons. still the same old stuff that I love. But, man, rock music today needs a new breath of fresh air. I think that, the, I mean, certainly online – like as you flip through the instrument of guitar is um, it's veering towards sensationalism a lot. Like it's sort of like, you know, how you have the singing contests online. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and that's not necessarily about like, it, when you think about who the great singers are, they weren't always great singers because of like range or anything sure. fantastic. They just had like a cool quality. And it's the same with guitar. It wasn't always the guy who like could play a million miles an hour or like, you know, um, play technically the greatest, you know, look at David Gilmore, man, you know, he was yeah. as slow hand as it gets and yet definitely a guitar great, you know, you never heard David Gilmore ripping off any fast licks, you know, I mean, it was always just really tasty. Um, so I think, you know, online, we're veering towards that. Like you scroll through Instagram and there's all these guys mm -hmm. shredding and there's all these guys shredding, but there's never the moment where it just kind of is like, oh, this is, you know, really, really tasteful music. And like, <laughs> well, and, and you know what it is too, Joel? And, and, I, and I'll point to an exact example of it. There's a guitar player out there named Nick Nocturnal who's huge on YouTube. He's like got, you know, 800,000 followers or some crazy number. And I know I talked to him one time and I just asked him, why don't you put together a band to go out there and play? And he's like, why? You know, because today's mentality is I can put out a song, I can get 2 million views on it and never, never have to haul my, my guitar and my amps and all that. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a different mentality than the mentality we grew up with, with holding an album and looking at it and then wanting to see that face from that record five feet in front of me you know it's just a different mm -hmm. mentality yeah and I, you know at the end of the day i think it's fine like it's it's just an observation because it, it's it's veered towards sensationalism but like mm -hmm. at the same time whatever keeps people into music you know right like, I, I if if forced to like have 
American Idol and the voice on television versus another, you know, keeping up with the Kardashians or whatever. Let's right. go with American Idol and the voice, <laughs> shall we? You know, I think we're all in agreement there. Right. So, I mean, you're, you're still better off having that because it's still going to make kids want to sing and mm -hmm. still like inspire them to, to um, pursue music. And, and the guitar thing is the same way. You know, it's like it might be a bit about that, but at least it's personally it's making people, um, you know, I guess, push themselves on the instrument. And, um, you know, it, it's all good at the end of the day. I guess, you know, I'm, I'm a bit of a rock dinosaur. You know, I mean, <laughs> I, I've been doing this a long time now. So I kind of I grew up, you know, playing in the bars and, and all that sure. and and you know, paying my dues. And uh, so it took a long time, in fact, for things to really kind of take off for me and have me do like relatively well, whatever we're going to say I do. Um, so, you know, I, I think all that was really good for me to go through all the different musical experiences. I, I, I really wouldn't change a thing, man. I sure. maybe just wish I was like, you know, financially set for life would be a great feeling right now. But, <laughs> you know, um, uh, beyond that, I, I kind of dig like the whole crazy path that I've had. Right. Now you what? grew up, I, I read playing piano and cello. Is that correct? Yeah, my parents were classical musicians, so they had me going really early, and I was really young. And I was like, man, I want to be a pitcher. Like, that's what I was doing back then. I used to pitch all day. Every okay. Day. And, like, I was like the, you know, the, the fastest pitcher in my little league and won the <laughs> World Series a couple times. And I was like, that, that's what I'm going to do. And then uh, suddenly everybody shot up to this height, and I was still here. And I was like, <laughs> oh, I'm not cool anymore. Everybody's, like, hitting my pitching. And I got – so, and right about at that same time was the ACDC thing for me, you know, okay. like that, and then going like, Hey, what about guitar? That could be cool. I like, got, I, I like that guy. And then, um, that really stuck. It just stuck from day one, you know, like I, it, it just took learning rock. Right. Um, so at first I, I had my stepmom's acoustic and I, uh, you know, had a teacher teaching me how to read the notes. And I was like, this isn't what I pictured it being. I, I want to be Angus Young. How do I get to do that when I'm learning, you know, the three notes on the high E string mm. here in the, in the book? Right. But, um, you know, thankfully, a friend of mine steered me towards this teacher that was teaching rock songs. And okay. so like, you know, for lesson number one, he showed me Paranoid. And I was like, that's the first rock <laughs> tune I learned how to play. And I went nice. like, you know, and my parents were like, well, we're not going to buy an amp until we're sure you're going to stick with this. You know, right. like I had to pay my dues for them to buy me an amp. But the luckily, that same teacher said, well, you know what you can do? You take this cable, you plug into the auxiliary input of your home stereo. And I went, <laughs> oh, cool. So home stereo <laughs> went on that and. Nice. And right at that point in time, the parents uh, were like, oh, my gosh, what have we gotten ourselves into here? You know, the whole neighborhood could hear me probably out of tune playing Paranoid. Did you ever think about doing like a classical kind of album? Somebody was texting and asking. Um, I mean, I've an acoustic album. did uh, classical guitar for, I would say, took lessons with that my last couple of years of high school and then actually did two years of college where I played more of that than I did rock. Um, but it just wasn't me at the end of the day, you know, right. like I, the way I look at myself with all this stuff is I've kind of understood, I have the understanding of how to play straight ahead jazz a bit as well. And I, I tinker with all this stuff, but I kind of like being able to pull some of those ideas into the rock world and be like, aha, you know, I got away with doing sure. that in, in the rock scene, uh, more so than actually pursuing um, you know, I, I think to do something like that, you really have to be like committed to that. And I just, I just wasn't who I am at the end of the day to be like, I'm just going to play classical guitar eight hours a day, you know? Sure. Definitely. You, you tour, tour the share. I have to know what that was like. Um, you know, that was cool. You know, Coverdale was having his knee replacement surgery done in 2017. So it gave us the heads up and. I just sent out a bunch of texts to people being like, hey, don't really need a new gig, but like if anybody needs a sub or somebody to fill in this year, let me know. Cause you know, I kind of got the year off of touring here and uh, that ended up being a really interesting year, just kind of, you know, building, building a lot of random things. And then, so one of the people I texted was my friend, Justin Derrico, who plays guitar with Pink and he plays on The Voice. And mm -hmm. the other guitar player on The Voice is Dave Barry, shares guitarist. And right at that time, he happened to be saying to him, man, I need to find somebody to fill in for me, you know, while I'm doing the voice here with, with Cher. Right. And so 
Justin said, I know it's going to sound weird, but what, what about Joel Hoster from Whitesnake? You know, he's like, he can play different styles and he can, he understands how to do this, you know? So um, anyway, I, it, that really was supposed to be like a few shows and it ended up being like a few years really. So it wow. turned into a lot more than I thought it was going to be. And uh, you know, it was great, great musicians, really good time. Um, as far as share, you know, I mean, it's not like we were hanging out going for coffee in the morning or something. Right. Like that. But, you know, she she had some fun stuff she would do with all of us where she would take us to the movies and stuff like that. Or there was like bingo night and like everybody would like <laughs> sure. hang out. And so, I mean, you know, she was cool. It just a different, different atmosphere than, um, you know, like say a buddy in your band. You're not going to be like, hey, what are you doing right now? You know, you want right. to hang out? And, right. I mean, you know. Did, did you take the online beating that like Demi Lovato, or Demi Lovato, um, Nita Strauss took when she joined Demi Lovato? Um, no, I think it was a, a different situation. I mean, I think that was, you know, sort of framed at the time. I mean, because she needed to miss some time that right. she was like quitting, even though I don't think she was really quitting. I think they were just kind of like, okay, she's going to go do this. Sure. Um, I always prioritize white snake over share so if, okay. there, if there was like a white snake show or a tour that was i was there right um, and i mean that was sort of the understanding when i got hired on share i was like well look you know i have two things that white snake and trans siberian orchestra that when those happen right I, I, I tried talking them out of hiring me basically i mean i was like look i don't know that i'm <laughs> really the right guy that you want to have like coming in here as like your full-time guy, because I have a couple things that are. Sure. So anyway, there's, there's the difference, I guess, you know, mm -hmm. and, and maybe if they had said up front, like Nita's going to take some time off to do that, mm -hmm. it would, she wouldn't have had that kind of um, response from rock. Yeah. Fans, yeah, you know? She did take a beating. Oh boy. <laughs> it was well, not for, well, the internet's never friendly though, is it? <laughs> no. Rock fans can be brutal sometimes. I mean, there's definitely some people that like, man, I lost a lot of, especially, you know, um, when you drag the politics into it, you know, people assume like whenever you're playing for somebody that you're mm. necessarily aligned with every single political view they must have, especially these days. And, right. You know, so, um, you know, that, there was a lot of, you know, uh, you know, share tends to be pretty outspoken with that. So there was a lot sure. of people that, you know, like, right. that. Yeah. From, you can still rock in America with night Ranger, you know, and it's to, to, you know, <laughs> to, to share. So, you know, that, like, you know, it, my whole thing is like, it's a gig. Like, right. I don't care. I'm like, I, I don't care. I mean, like the politics are not my thing, man. You know, I'm, right. I'm just, like I just want to play my guitar. Can I just play? Exactly. What about well, TSO? How's it going with TSO? What's it like playing that kind of music compared to the white snake stuff? Um, well, TSO is like, you know, it's trans Siberian orchestra, right? Mm -hmm. So there's number one is a lot more people. Uh, it's something that I would say there's just because of the history that being sabotage and to maximize the amount of shows, it's essentially sabotage split two ways. And then they fill in the band with people, me, you know, somebody like myself being one of those people. Um, it's, so you just find the, you know, you, you just know your place in every gig you do, like what the situation is, you know, I mean, it, it's important to me, like with white snake that, um, you know, for obviously it's David Coverdale's band, you know, but like, you know, David does put us on the shirts and he puts us in the tour programs and sure. he right with, I got to write with him on the, the last record. And, right. um, you know, you, you definitely feel like, Hey, band you know so and david's really great about championing his players and you know promoting online and um that's uh just something that's been great about that especially because you know for me leading into white snake there had been a lot of u.s stuff for me you know mm -hmm. i was i was playing rock of ages in new york city eight shows a week i was touring with trans siberian orchestra in the u.s and i right. was like um, Night Ranger, we, we, we would go to Japan and maybe like an occasional like one off in the UK or something, but pretty much a US band, you know, Night Ranger does a lot of uh, US dates. 
And so for me, it was really cool joining White Snake because it was like, hey, people in South America care. People all across Europe care. People in the UK really care about White Snake. You know, right. there was such a long history there before um, the band broke. And, you know, so being able to go to Australia and South America and, and you know, um, different territories than I've ever been able to get to and have people actually care like who I was was right. amazing to me. You know? <laughs> like, are, nice. are those overseas shows kind of cool or is there a bigger response audience size wise than here in the States? Cause I mean, I, it seems like rock in general does a lot better now anyways, when you see the concerts overseas. I'd say definitely in the UK. I mean, I think it depends on what area white snake plays in, but like, you know, the UK, we were, we headlined arenas going through there on the right. beach, this farewell tour. I mean, I don't know that in the U S we would necessarily be able to headline arenas, you know, okay. um, we might, we were slated to open for the scorpions, um, it, you know, in sheds and, right. uh, and some arenas, I think, but, um, I, th I think you could safely say that white snake is more popular in the UK than in the U S I did. That's just by nature. Cause there was, you know, so many records were big there before right. white snake even became popular in the U S right. Definitely being on tour a lot. Like, you know, like, like you are, um, I know here in Cleveland, like a lot of the small clubs and venues that used to have all these rock bands come in all the time. Um, is that the same way across the country? Are all, a lot of these small clubs and little venues closing up? Or I mean, that's the way rock music was meant to be. And, and now it seems like a lot of those places aren't around anymore. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, 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 I know like, you know, heading out and doing some of the, the, I guess, smaller stuff that I do are the acoustic duo shows of my friend Brandon Gibbs. And yeah. we're still able to find a little network of things that we can go do out there and be able to play. And um, I personally like that because those are the shows where like the actual fans show up, like the people that actually care who you are. Um, you know, you take the bigger gigs and there's going to be a significant portion of that audience that's the casual fan that might not even know, like, my name by the end of the gig or, you know, walk out and go, yeah, the, the, you know, the blonde haired guy. Or whatever, <laughs> you know, that. So when you when you're playing those smaller gigs and it's advertised under your name, that's who you really start seeing who the diehard fans are who sure. are really following everything you're doing and and come out so those can be really cool to play um because you it gives you an opportunity to connect with your really diehard fan base right on. um so i i think there's still opportunities out there um i suppose it's like anything else in life you could look at like every obstacle or you could look at the stuff that's there you know right well, there's no question it's not what it used to be but it hasn't been what it used to be since i even got old enough to be gigging with bands i mean right. when, in the chicago area where i grew up the drinking age was 18 prior to okay. my just prior to my days you know what i mean if you go back to the 70s so you take like a lot of those bands like when sticks was a local band you know mm -hmm. banging around there those guys were you know they're playing both nights on the weekend and you know making mad bank and we're for, for kids in high school that is you know? right and uh and living it up for my generation we kind of would play like the all ages show maybe once a month maybe twice a month right um but yeah we still had some great great talent in the scene you know in in my little local area there in the, the suburbs of chicago you know disturbed came out of there right I used, you know, used to be in the same local scene with Dan Donegan, their guitarist, and you know, it's fun for me to see him succeed and do well, and and um, see those guys do well. Danny was always a great guy. He was a great guy even when we were just little kids, you know. When we were, I've known him since I was probably fourteen or something like that. He was always a great guy. Right on. Well, dude, let's pull it back to your record because we do got to promote the record. Joel Holkstra's thirteen Crash of Life on June the thirteenth. It will be out. Everybody should buy it, not just stream it, but actually buy it. Yes. That's like a rule. You have to buy music if it's available to buy. But is, it not, is it not June 16? Is it June 16? I think it's so good. Okay. All right. I Either I've been saying it wrong all day and you're right. I'm glad you're on here because. Uh, I, 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 could, I could very well be wrong. I, I, I took it from the 16. press release, but. I, I think it's June 16, bro. 
I'm pretty sure. All right, the, the second week of June, go buy it. How's that? In fact, go buy it now, right? Can you pre-order it? Yeah, yeah, you can pre-order right now. So yeah. don't even wait for the date. Buy it today right. as soon as this interview ends. Yeah, you can just yes. get it. <laughs> and just be yours when it when it's absolutely fun. well dude let's dig into a couple of the tunes man because there, there's a couple songs that i i really really dug my favorite being damaged goods which is your guitar playing on that alone you know you don't do yourself justice talking about yourself as a player this one song has you playing like three or four different styles of guitar all mixed mixed and matched but it works Talk a little bit about this one, man, because I got to imagine of all of the songs on this, this had to be your showcase song. Um, this was just a, you know, like a, I, I suppose like a, you know, a cool little hook with the vocal and the guitar kind of doubling it because yeah. the opening riff was really busy. So when you when you write a really busy riff on guitar, you go, it's almost kind of Iron Maidenish or something, right? You know, and then you think, okay, so what's the hook over the top? Because that might be a cool riff, but it's not like something some people can sing. I always like having like a section have something that can be something that people can have stuck in their head. Right. Um, so that required me writing that little melodic hook over the top. Right. Um, and then the, uh, I would say the verse is kind of like that core sound of the Joel Hoshis 13 thing, that like Dio-ish kind of sound. You mm -hmm. know, I get the on drums in this and, uh, Tony Franklin on bass, who, yeah. you know, he, he fits right into that style, that sound um, so well. Um, and so that's always kind of been the core, you know, and, and sure. Gears might have a different tone than Dio, but he likes, he sings gritty. And so I'd say that it's kind of based on that. And, uh, you know, the chorus, I mean, almost like might, might even be like a little bit of like a Pantera-ish kind of riff mm -hmm. in a way. Maybe not as aggressive a tone as, as Dimebag, but, you know, sure. um, but like where that riff is derived from or influenced by. So, sure. Um, well, you know, you, you took some Iron Maiden, you put some Pantera in. I can't imagine how any metalhead could think that's bad. I mean, it's yeah, so no, good. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it, Damaged Goods is, fits in like slightly below the heaviest tracks. I, I feel sure. like the heaviest tracks are probably like far too deep and everybody knows everything. And mm -hmm. then, you know, Damaged Goods fits right in there. Sure. So there's like this heavier end of the spectrum. And then, you know, you've got... Um, a couple ballads, you know, mellower tunes. And then somewhere in between, you got stuff that kind of falls in the Zeppelin ACDC kind of influence category, right. you know, like um, uh, Don't Have Words is very ACDC influenced. And sure. um, uh, You're Right For Me is very Zeppelin-y. It's like, uh, I wrote that on, you know, an open tuning on acoustic, like Jimmy Page right. you know, would, would be in the open tunings. And, and then I ended up just throwing a Sans amp on there to distort it a little bit. And okay. Kind of out and then add some power chords around it and tough right. it out a bit you know sure and then the other one you know since we're since we're just throwing names out there not tonight feels very white snake like almost like that could have been something you wrote for white snake and didn't make it but it's got a very still of the night ish that da -da 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 -da, you know at the beginning part like yeah so for me that feels like zeppelin -y, okay you know which is white snakey you yeah. know definite correlation between zeppelin and white snake and then uh the chorus i would say for me is like you know dockinish or something uh, okay yeah you know like i could hear don dockin singing that melody in the chorus sure. very easily so you know and that's all kind of stuff i grew up on as well I, that's my first band that i was ever in we, we covered a lot of them that was the band that we sounded good covering our singer sounded a little like him and i you know was could cover george's stuff a little bit at that age and so sure. Very good, man. Well, dude, you mentioned Gearish, uh, Gearish Prod, Prod, is it Prodden? I don't know how to say his last name. Man, no, you I don't. You know. either. I, <laughs> uh, the funniest story was I sent, so they wanted us to do an announcement about this and, yeah. and kind of release it staggered. And so I, I sent a voice memo to, uh, to one of the guys at the label and said, so uh, Gearish Pradhan, right? Is that how I pronounce his name? Because I don't want to say it incorrectly right. on this. And they said, "Yeah, man, no, you got it. That's it, dude." So I, so I made this this video, and then it, when it came time for him to make his, you know, he said it with an accent that I was like, "Oh, forget it." <laughs> baseball man, I was like, it sounded nothing like the way I said it. So I went, "Okay, I guess we're just, you know, 
look, my name is supposed to be, if you do the Dutch pronunciation, have like a hook, hook. Hoekstra. You know, like a hook, but right. nobody would ever get that out of H O E K. So I, I just say hoekstra because right. I have mercy on, you know, the. <laughs> on us. <laughs> on us, yeah. yeah. I mean, my name is not enough to, to say or spell anyway. So, I mean, I'm right. like, look, I got enough problems on my hands, much less hoping they're going to get the Dutch thing going. <laughs> right on, man. Well, dude, I did want to talk about Gearish, who, you know, I, for me personally, the best album of 2022 was his, was the was the Gears and the Chronicles record. So good. So for anybody that likes 80s style, it's so out of the Skid Row-ish sort of book, you know, that, that anybody that like that will love that. How did, he, how did you end up working with him? And specifically, how do you end up working with anybody and not just elevating your guy, JSS, up to being the singer in your band? Um, well, I mean, Jeff sang half the lead vocals on the first record. Yeah. And so it was Russell Allen and then Jeff sang, sang half of the lead vocals. And that was like kind of the only bag on that album was people were like, I don't get the two lead singers. It's like, well, it's a project, man. I can do whatever right. I want, right? <laughs> right. Leave me alone. And uh, it's Jeff's got Soto, damn it. Um, and then the second one, I decided, well, let's just have Russell sing it. And and I was, and Jeff and I are just, you know, we're good friends. And that, so he does these as mainly a favor to me, you know, like singing background on the, the second one. And then um, with this one, uh, with Girish, same thing. I think it comes down to more the fact that Jeff already fronts a lot of stuff. And right. Like, you know, yeah, Jeff could sing it and front it, sure, easily, you know. Um, but, you know, at the same time, like he, he, He's got a lot of stuff that he already does. Yeah, yeah I know. I get a press release every month with his next release. It's crazy yeah. with that guy. <laughs> so, I mean, for me, it was kind of a, an opportunity to, uh, you know, start out with Girish, who, you know, was um, kind of, I, I guess, you know, got that young and hungry eye of the tiger thing going on. Sure. Right you know, I think he's looking to make a name for himself. And, um as you said, like, you know, I watched uh, the Gearish and the Chronicles stuff when the label said, what about what about this guy? And and they sent me um, some links and I went, well, yeah, amazing screamer. But like like you said, it's kind of like, you know, a young Sebastian Bach or something. Mm -hmm. We're like, wow, man, you know, this dude's like screaming away. It's amazing range. Problem is, is like with my stuff, I'm like, OK, my stuff's more like Ronnie James Dio through like Lou Graham or Paul Rogers. Right. right? Mm -hmm. So it takes some ability to just kind of sing and not none of those guys are were the high screamer type. Right. But even Dio wasn't really a high screamer type. Yeah, power, true. Power screamer, but not really like, a you know, a high, um, high tenor, you know, that kind of came in with Jeff Tate doing all mm -hmm. that stuff. Everybody started doing that after Jeff Tate was. Done, right. right. Um, so. Anyway, I, I just gave Gears to stop and was like, you know, look, this is kind of, you know, the vibe. And, and the, every track I got from him, I was like, wow, well, he can really do it all. He's really a chameleon. He can kind of fit the vibe of whatever the song needs. So he's kind of the, the perfect guy because the music is is pretty diverse on the record. Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, it's not like there's like, hey, every song sounds exactly the same. It ranges from that really heavy stuff to like, you know, ballad -y kind of stuff that even, right. you know, one of the ballads even has some kind of R&B type changes on this. Um, so it's it's a pretty diverse sound of record. So finding someone that can fit the bill and all that, it's not easy. Right on. Well, we appreciate you coming on, man. Uh, yeah. So much appreciate it. The new album, again, June 16th. That's what we're going with, correct? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Got to make sure to buy it on June 16th. Pre-order it now. Uh, appreciate you coming on, man. It was, it was fun. I enjoyed it. So Yeah, no, thank you so much. I, I appreciate you guys helping out and spreading the word. Definitely. Absolutely. I, I just, we need more new, good rock music. So keep it coming, my friend. Thank you. Well, my pleasure. I'll, I'll do. I, I'm working hard every day, brother. <laughs> All, right, sure. well, All right. We'll talk to you. Thank you so much, man. All right, Joel. Thanks, buddy. Cool. Uh, thanks so much, guys. Thank right. you. Peace. Good dude, man. Good yeah. stuff. Joel Holzer, right. he rules. Um, June 16th. <laughs> June 16th, Crash of Life. Right. <laughs> but buy it now. 13, 16, just buy it now. Don't don't waste your time you waiting. You said that uh, the guy, the name you can't pronounce? Gearish, yeah, Gearish Pradhan, I think. And you sent me some of his stuff in, uh, earlier. And yeah. It, it does rock, man. I mean, It's really good. There is some good shit out there that I didn't know about. So Yeah. 
There's there's more and more. I was going to bring Gears in the Chronicles to the to the uh, new music moment at some point here. I figured this week we're doing live new music moment with Joe yeah. Holkstra. Well, but good. but yeah, good stuff. Just live right. music. We're going to take a quick break and then um Target wants you to tuck your stuff away. And, <laughs> Fun. Uh, here's some more Joel. Hang on. All right. Once or twice would be nice to be heard and seen. 